All right, so I think we'll make a start. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, coming today to the second in our seminar series uh, on ethics and the uh, challenges of the 21st century. Uh, this, is a, this is a new series, a new initiative from the uh, Oxford Martin School. Uh, if you're not familiar with the school, uh, it's, a, it's a collection of uh, institutes that are each focused on tackling uh, major challenges that are emerging in the near and distant future. And uh, today's uh, seminar uh, deals with one of these challenges, which is very much in the news at the moment, uh, which is the use of uh, technology, computers and, and robots in particular in, in warfare. Uh, so our speaker today is uh, Alex Leveringhouse, uh, who is uh, focused on a project uh, that, that uh, deals with these issues, uh, the project on milita uh, military enhancement, is that right? Uh, with the uh, institute known as the uh, Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict uh, Institute um, that is uh, focused on a range of issues around uh, warfare and armed conflict uh, around the world. Uh, Alex is going to be speaking to us uh, for about 35 uh, minutes. <coughs> Uh, and then we'll have a comment from the co-director of the, of the uh, program, uh, Dapo Akande, um, for uh, five or ten minutes, uh, after which I will ask first question, and then uh, we'll open it up for discussion at that point. Uh, so please, everybody, uh, join me in welcoming Alex. Yeah, so um, thank you very much for the introduction, Bennett. Um, and thanks um, also to the Oxford Martin School to... Um, organize this fantastic event and to give me an opportunity to present and showcase um, some of the work I'm doing. Um, I'm going to be talking today um, about military robots, also known as killer robots, in the press. And this is a big issue, and it's going to remain a big issue um, in the foreseeable future. Some of these military robots are already operational, others are being developed um, as we speak, and so this, this problem of robotic warfare using robots in conflict is going to um, remain with us. And um, it's very interesting, if you look at the military, um, they're obviously under great pressure to reduce their spending, you have all these kind of budget cuts, we have self-imposed austerity in Western societies, but funnily enough, um, the spending on military robotics is ring-fenced uh, within the military. So they're all rather keen on continuing um, the development of these kinds of machines. Now, what I want to do in this um, brief lecture is just to give you an overview of what's out there in terms of robots, because the category of military robots is actually rather broad. I mean, there are a wide variety of systems um, that are currently being utilized by the military and uh, that are being developed by the military. And it's always um, important to be clear what we're actually talking about when we're talking about the military robots. Um, Julian Zavalesko, who organized um, this series, sent out an email and said, well, you know, I want you to talk about your scientific work. Don't talk about the ethics too much yet. Um, that's what we want to discuss in the discussion. Well, I am an, an ethicist, right? So I will find it very hard to avoid ethical issues altogether. But what I will do, I, I won't say too much about the ethical issues. Rather, I will just indicate some ways in which one can think about the ethical issues arising from these systems. I would kind of Show, show what's relevant and where one might take the, the ethical discussion of military robotics. Um, I will also, um, in addition to doing this, um, I'll say a little bit more about the Military Enhancement Project, which is run here um, at Oxford in the um, Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict, together with the uh, Delft University of Technology. It's um, a project which is financed by the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. And there's sort of a group of researchers here at Oxford which looks at the um, ethical and legal side of military robotics. And then it's a technical university. You've got the engineers um, at Delft. And some of the philosophers and the engineers, they have to cooperate with each other. And that is sometimes rather difficult, I must say. Um, I'm working on this project together. I'm with a fellow postdoc from TU Delft, Dr. Chuck de Grave, who is a roboticist, a cognitive engineer, and who works in artificial intelligence. And unfortunately, Chuck can't be with us today because he's got some teaching commitments um, at TU Delft on Fridays, and he couldn't rearrange them. So unfortunately, he can't be here. But um, a lot of what I'm going to say, really, comes out of the discussions I've had with Chuck. Um, over the last couple of months, and I really want this to be understood kind of as a collaborative project. These are not just my own thoughts, but Jack has been very much involved in this presentation as well and in this research project in general. So 
said he can't be here, but he's kind of still here in spirit somehow in the presentation. Basically, all the techie stuff comes from Jack, and all the kind of moral stuff comes from me. Um, right. Okay, so let me start off by just with a couple of observations about robots. Um, because robots are around in society. Um, they're being used in a wide variety of settings. And, um, but we're not always aware of it. I mean, sometimes we are actually interacting with a robot. We are not, but we're not aware that it is a robot. So if, you know, some of you might have had the questionable uh, pleasure of having to get to City Airport in London on time... And, you know, if you try to do this, you would probably have taken the Docklands Light Railway, which is up there on the screen. And, of course, the Docklands Light <laughs> Railway is a robotic vehicle. Or if you're ordering something from an online retailer, and that online retailer has a warehouse, and it will probably be a robot which collects your goods. So here you see um, one of those. Uh, here you see warehouse robots. Um, we recently had a lot of cold weather in the UK. So you can, if you're sitting back in the living room, you're making a nice cup of tea and you crank up the heating, right? And if you have a gas-powered heating, um, the gas might come from a gas well, which is serviced by a robot. And then last but not least, no robotics presentation would ever be complete without a Roomba. Okay, Roomba is down here. That's, that's the fella down here, right? And Roomba is the world's first robotic hoover. And it's, it, it, and it's absolutely, it's excellent. Basically what Roomba does, uh, I always want one, but they're a little bit too expensive at the moment. So I'm just waiting for the price to go down. And it's like, like a hawk, just get myself a Roomba. But um, anyways, um, so you can pre-program Roomba, and then it can hoover your living room uh, without you doing anything. Uh, it can just do that completely independently of you. And it's, 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 it's a brilliant machine. So when Roomba senses, so it has sensors, so it can navigate your living room. It doesn't bump into things, you know, it doesn't fall down the stairs, it, you know, it doesn't do that. It has sensors. But even better, so when its battery runs low, Roomba returns automatically to his docking station, recharges himself, I'm saying himself, itself, or it just seems to be human in a way, right? Recharges itself, and then, you know, once its batteries are full again, it's been energized again, quite literally, um, sort of, it, you know, continues where it left off. So you come back home after a long day and Roomba has kind of cleaned your living room, which is really excellent. So robots are around. They're not just being used in the military and they are being put really to a wide variety of users. So more generally, I mean, why do we want these robots? Um, and if you ask people why they want robots or roboticists, why they think robots are a jolly good idea, um, they would usually reply, well, we want robots because of the four Ds. And uh, those are tasks that are dull, dirty, dangerous, and dodgy. I mean, cleaning my living room for Roomba would certainly be a dirty task. Um, but, of course, there are also dangerous tasks. If you're thinking about servicing an underwater gas well, you know, that's kind of dangerous. And uh, probably kind of a lot of dodgy tasks, yeah, as well. Probably a lot of dull tasks. If you're um, commuting kind of between different terminals at an airport, um, you know, it makes sense to use a robotic vehicle because I guess a human would get bored just doing that. Also, of course, I mean, if you're thinking about these four Ds and you're thinking about these different dull, dirty, dangerous and dodgy tasks, I mean, then, of course, um, you're also thinking about the military. I mean, there are certainly a lot of dangerous tasks in the military. And I think, as a result, it doesn't come as a surprise at all that these systems are being used in the military or that robots are being used in the military. So what I want to do is just to give you an indication of the kind of systems that are out there in the armed forces at the moment. So let me start with this little fella here. Um, that's the Dragon Runner robot. Uh, Dragon Runner robot is used at the moment by the British Armed Forces in Afghanistan to dismantle uh, improvised explosive devices and landmines. And this is actually how a lot of this robotic stuff started out in the military, right? Um, you know, you had the Americans and their allies invade, invade Iraq, invade Afghanistan. They're completely messed up. And they had a nice insurgency on their hands, right? And one way in which the insurgency fought, of course, the occupying forces was by placing very primitive um, improvised explosive devices alongside roads, close to military stations, and so on. And of course, I mean, they were losing people. I mean, there were heavy casualties over this because of these very primitive devices. And so they invested heavily into these robots and said, well, we need robots to dismantle those sorts of things. If a robot gets blown up, you just buy a new one. And, you know, the human being uh, gets blown up. That's, of course, bad. So this is how a lot of this stuff really started and uh, started to gain speed in the military. So this is the Alpha Dog. Um, Alpha Dog's a very nice robot. Um, he's kind of a robotic pack mule. He carries equipment. 
And um, if, you, if you're a little bit bored, you know, you're sitting in your office or in the library in the afternoon, it's Friday, it's after lunch, don't go on Facebook. Just Google AlphaDog. And, you know, go on, go, go on the internet, Google AlphaDog, because there are loads of hilarious videos on the web where AlphaDog is being tested, right? And especially, so you see people who attempt to kick AlphaDog over, and he stabilizes. He doesn't fall over at all, right? <laughs> and they even use AlphaDog on ice, and you see kind of AlphaDog with four legs sort of slipping towards that, but he never falls over. It's a fantastic machine. Um, so this is AlphaDog. He carries stuff for soldiers. Um, well, this is a much more sinister fellow. Um, this is the Sentry robot uh, manufactured by Samsung. So I wonder how Apple is actually going to respond to this Sentry robot. The I, the I Sentry. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and the Sentry robot, the Sentry robot is sort of a bad dude, right? Um, but you're unlikely to encounter him because he mostly hangs around in the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. And what he does, basically, he defends the border, right? Uh, he's a border robot. He mends border posts there. Um, what does he do? I mean, how does he work? Uh, well, I mean, let's put it this way. He's got two machine guns and a gun that fires rubber bullets. Also got a camera and a variety of sensors so it can spot targets, it can spot, uh, it can spot shapes, targets, human beings, you know, from a couple of kilometers away. And then it has a microphone and it has a loudspeaker. And through the loudspeaker, it will ask you for a password. If you happen to be in the demilitarized zone, you know, and you encounter the sentry robot, he will ask you for a it, it, it will ask you for a password. Then it has a microphone. And so it can hear what you say. And if you don't know the password, you've got a problem. And you can only pray. You can only pray that you use the rubber bullets, right, rather than the machine guns. So this is, this is the sentry robot. Um, so that's a proper killer robot, man. Um, this is Tenaris, also um, a very nice device, um, currently being tested by BAA systems. And it's an unmanned aerial vehicle. And it can kind of fly around by itself, and it can track and destroy radar stations. So you just pre-program it, you know, it flies off, and um, it can destroy radar stations all by itself. And there is another one. I don't actually have a um, photo of it, but there's another one of these um, unmanned aerial vehicles that can land and take off from an aircraft carrier all by itself. And that's probably, I mean, if you're into aviation, probably one of the most difficult maneuvers you could ever think about. But the machine can do this all by itself. It's, it's a similar one to the Tenaris one. Um, so it can do that. So that's being developed as well. Right. So these are the, these kinds of different robots, right, that are currently operational in the military or that are being developed in the military. And now if you're a philosopher like me, you like to draw distinctions. Distinctions are very, very important if you're doing analytical <coughs> philosophy. You're paid to draw distinctions. So let me draw sort of a first set of distinctions with regard to some of these systems uh, we've already seen in order to narrow down the field in order to narrow down the subject. And I think one can distinguish between these robots in terms of their lethality, right? Are they lethal or are they not lethal? And of course, based upon this distinction, you are kind of faced with different moral problems, really. So you could say that you have non-lethal military robots. That's the alpha dog, for example. It's non-lethal, it just carries your stuff and doesn't fall over. Then you could have non-lethal robots um, whose application is primarily non-lethal, but who nevertheless, whose operation could have um, lethal side effects. Electronic countermeasure systems um, could be, and software robots could be seen as robots that have these kinds of um, lethal side effects. And then, of course, you get what I call robotic targeting systems. And the very point of a robotic targeting system is, of course, to apply force to a target in order to kill it or in order to destroy it. Right. And it seems to me that these robotic targeting systems do raise the most profound and most difficult issues. I mean, if you're specifically you know, setting out to kill someone or design a technology that enables you to apply <coughs> force to a target, and I think you have a fairly high threshold of moral justification you have to achieve before you can um, you know, proceed with developing this particular technology. And of course, the best example of these robotic targeting systems are the Sentry robot, which we've just seen, uh, which is the border, border post robot, and of course, the Tenaris aircraft. They are both targeting systems. I mean, they're there to destroy stuff and to apply force um, to a target. So this is the first set of distinctions I want to draw. And everything I say now is really aimed at these robotic targeting systems. And you can talk about all these systems, and you could probably talk for hours here, but um, what I want to do is narrow it down, make the discussion a bit more manageable, and talk about these robotic targeting systems. They seem to me uh, to be the most morally problematic systems. Now, um, let me draw a further set of distinctions. And I want to distinguish within this group of robotic targeting systems between 
um, robotic targeting systems that are remote controlled, um, or what some people would call semi-autonomous, and I'll say more about this later, that are remote controlled, um, which basically means that an operator makes decisions, right? It's a little bit like one of those remote controlled cars. You've got someone there who's got sort of a remote control pad and he can, he can control the machine. Um, and, that, and the best example here would be an unmanned aerial vehicle, or current, the current generation of unmanned aerial vehicles, like, for example, the Predator drone. And I'll say something more about the Predator drone in a minute. Um, these are essentially remote-controlled robots, right? These things are not doing stuff by themselves, or they only do some things by themselves, but at least the targeting decisions are made by a human operator. Um, the second class of systems, they are autonomous uh, robotic targeting systems. And of course, I mean, the term autonomy here is very, very problematic. And I'm going to come back to this um, in, in, in a short while. And autonomous targeting systems would be uh, systems like the Sentry robot, right? Or would be systems like the Tenaris aircraft. They don't really rely on an operator to do their stuff, to do their job. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to start by looking at um, these remote-controlled robotic targeting systems. And then I want to say something about the autonomous robotic targeting systems. And then I'll tell you something about what we do with those systems as part of the military enhancement um, project here at Oxford. Right. So remote-controlled robotic targeting systems. Um, they are also known as teleoperated systems. So what, what does uh, lie behind this term teleoperated? And the idea is basically that they have a set of sensors, and via those sensors they transmit information, which um, is then relayed onto a video screen, and where it can be viewed by an operator or by a group of operators, or in fact, you know, very different people. And a targeting decision based on the information received, you know, the information you see in your video screen, a targeting decision will be made by a chain of command, and then in this robotic targeting system, the operator can enact the um, targeting decision by, say, uh, pressing a button, right? So the idea is here that you don't need to be directly present in order to target someone. Rather, you have a system, you know, that's flying around somewhere, such as a drone. You get certain images from the system that enable you to interpret the situation, and then you can decide what to do, and you can enact, these, uh, you can act, enact the decision via the remote control. Of course, um, the best example of such a remote-controlled um, robot is, as I already indicated, um, the Predator drone. And the Predator drone is, of course, um, used in the so-called war on terror for targeted killings. And, of course, yesterday there were congressional hearings, so that's been in the news. But it is a remote-controlled uh, robot. And as you can see here, um, it started out as a system for reconnaissance missions originally, but it has here it has sort of nice little Hellfire missiles that you can launch in order to destroy um, a target. So how does the how does the Predator drone work? Um, so this is basically the communication system of the Predator drone. So you have um, you have a ground control ground control station down here. They will probably uh, start the drone. They control the drone sort of for a little while after you know via a line of site data link. And so you know they control it probably until it's reached a certain height or it's reached a certain speed. And then you can switch over, as it were, from the drone via a satellite to a different uh, control station. So these guys, they are probably sitting somewhere in Afghanistan. They're kind of starting the drone. So once the drone is airborne and it's flying towards its target or it's flying to a particular theater, they switch everything over via a satellite link so that, for example, people in Langley or in New Mexico or in Nevada can view exactly the same images that the drone transmit, uh, transmits here via its sensor. So here you've got a couple of tanks, right? The drone has a sensor, you can look up at, at those tanks, and those images are then relayed back to whoever um, kind of picks them up. And a lot of these drone operators, they are in Nevada, they are in New Mexico. And of course, I mean, they don't necessarily all have to be in the same place. So you can have a drone operator somewhere in Nevada, but you can have a CIA official sitting somewhere in Langley, right? And they both view the same images. And then, you know, the CIA officials in Langley, they might make a decision to target, to, tell, to take out Mokta or Mokta or whomever. And they basically just issue a command to the drone operator, who then, sitting in Nevada, just presses, presses the button and launches the Hellfire missile. So this is how this remote controlled um, system work. Here you see one of these individual uh, command stations. They have got a couple of screens here. And, you know, you have the different operators sitting there looking at those screens and interpreting the kind of information they receive from the drone. And, of course, they are flying it. Um, you see they've got their joysticks there. They can you move, move the drone around. It's completely, in a way, dependent on them. Right. 
I mean, what sort of moral issues um, does this give rise to? And I think uh, there are two questions that you could ask here about these systems. Um, the first question is whether these uh, robotic targeting systems, these remote control systems, really raise any morally distinctive issues compared to other systems. I mean, if, I mean, if you look at the press, you know, if you look at the kind of discussion about drones, you've got the impression, wow, this is all new, right? The military is changing, armed conflict is changing. But, man, is it really? I mean, is there really something new being introduced here? And are the kind of changes to the military that are being made via the introduction of these auto uh, sorry, of these unmanned systems, remote control systems, I mean, are there really any new moral issues um, arising from this? I mean, one moral issue, for example, you could, of course, cite is the question of asymmetry, the relationship between the actual operator who applies the force or who makes a targeting decision and the actual target. Um, you know, it's not exactly equal. I mean, the target can do very little to defend itself against against a drone, right? This is not really kind of face-to-face -face combat where you have a guy somewhere lying in a trench throwing a grenade and another one shooting mach the machine gun to uh, defend himself. You know, these two people in those trenches, I mean, they are posed using direct material threats to each other. And if you look at some of these just war theorists, like, for example, Michael Walzer, they use this uh, very fact in order to justify the right to kill. Um, you know, <coughs> combatants pose material threats to each other. But of course, I mean, that's not the case here. So there is, it seems to me, a moral asymmetry between the actual target and between the combatant who uses force. But is this unique, really, to drones? I mean, it's the same probably if you look at a jet fighter, right? I mean, they, if, you, if you're like a stealth pilot and you're on a bombing mission and you're bombing a target, you know, sort of thousands of miles below you, I mean, the people on the ground, they're not really going to do anything against you. Again, you know, there is, there is also an asymmetry in these other kind of um, these other systems. I mean, look at modern artillery, for example, right? It introduces an element of distance, of course. And the question is whether, you know, the kind of distance that's being introduced in these other systems already existing, oh, sorry, this kind of distance that's there in these already existing systems like jet fighters, like artillery, like naval defense system, whether that's really kind of a different moral issue as it is in those sorts of drones. The second question, of course, is, I mean, are probably, and that's the controversial part, I mean, are these systems uh, morally preferable over other systems? Um, are these robotic targeting systems that are remote controlled preferable, or preferable probably over artillery or over a jet fight? I mean, what would be the kind of moral considerations that would help us to answer this question? Of course, I mean, you could always argue that there are some weapons that are intrinsically wrong. Um, you could always say that, that they should not be developed at all, right? And it doesn't really matter whether you compare them to other weapons or not. And it seems to me the best example of an intrinsically immoral weapon really is a weapon of mass destruction, right? Because it's specifically engineered to kill everyone, you know, regardless of whether that person is a combatant or a non-combatant. It kills civilians, it's, it kills military personnel. And it seems to me that that at least is very, very morally problematic. So it would violate, for sure, the... Um, um, criterion of discrimination, that's there in international humanitarian law, which asks um, um, combatants to distinguish between non-combatants, those who are not taking part in hostilities, and of course between uh, combatants, those who take part in hostilities, and that of course also plays an important role in just war theory. And it seems to me weapons of mass destruction are, I mean, and there are other reasons as well, but for this reason alone, it seems to me that weapons of mass destruction are intrinsically wrong. But, you know, are these kinds of systems intrinsically wrong somehow? And I'm not so sure um, that this is the case. I mean, I don't think they are specifically engineered to violate certain moral and legal criteria, to violate legal and moral restraints. I mean, there's nothing inherently, I think, indiscriminate in those kinds of systems. So I think if you want to think morally about the systems, partly you have to ask a comparative question. You have to compare them to other systems. Uh, for example, the jet fighter, for example, modern artillery. And you have to ask yourself, are they preferable over these other systems that we think are legal, that we think are moral to use, or are there really big differences that show that we should not use drones in warfare or use these remote, con excuse me, use these remote controlled robots in warfare? Right. Um, yeah, all right. So we've got an um, old fam familiar face here uh, from the British Intelligence Services. Just, just, to, dis just, just to get this straight, um, you know, partly this stuff about drones is so controversial because the war on terror is controversial, right? And the question really is, I mean, is the technology as such controversial or is the technology at the moment 
being perceived as controversial because the war on terror is controversial, because it's not clear in this war, you know, who is a combatant, who is a non-combatant, traditional legal understanding of war, war takes place between states, uh, between sovereign entities, now here war is taking place between states, the US and uh, a non-state actor like Al-Qaeda, and of course that makes it very problematic. But I think um, it's important to be aware that we would have targeted killings, even if we didn't have drones. It would just be that James Bond would do it, right? So you would send James Bond out to take out Osama bin Laden or whomever. And of course, you could also use a drone to do this. Are there any differences, right? On the other hand, so I think you could have the war on terror, for example, and targeted killings with our drones, right? And um, you could just use uh, secret agents, for example. On the other hand, I mean, you could also imagine cases where you know the the use of drones does not appear to be that problematic i mean imagine for example um, a classic war of self defense against unjust aggression so for example imagine um, you have a country or you have a state called red and it aggresses a state called blue it kind of sends its sober soldiers into blue's territory and so this is an act of aggression and blue just elects um, to you know use unmanned robots remote controlled robots in addition to its jet fighters and so on in order to hold um, red's offensive i mean is there anything wrong I mean, is there anything is there any reason for why blue should not use these um, remote controlled robots to hold the offensive given that that really would be a, at least a just war a just war of self defense so these are, i think are just sort of some questions worthwhile worthwhile pondering Right, let me move on now to um, autonomous robots. And as you see, I mean, as this is probably quite um, conceptually um, problematic. Roomba, for example, would be an autonomous robot. And what would the high priest of philosophy, uh, of autonomy in modern philosophy, Immanuel Kant, think about this? And just imagine, Roomba would have been around in Königsberg when Kant, would have, when Kant was writing. Um, you know, probably the, the history of philosophy would have changed. Kant would have rewritten the groundwork of the metaphysics of molds. It might have looked very differently. Kant, of course, had a servant called Lampe, uh, but he was a human being, okay? But um, he, he did not have Roomba. So something very odd seems to be going on. I mean, if Roomba can be autonomous, and if we have Kant who defends kind of the value of autonomy, something very, very fishy is going on here. So let me try to draw another distinction here. I'm drawing a lot of distinctions, so I hope I do well philosophically, you know, lots and lots of distinctions. And I think it makes sense to distinguish here between moral... I mean, it took me a while to persuade engineers actually to accept this distinction. I was like, this robot is autonomous. And I was like, no, it isn't. Now, this robot is really autonomous. Like, no, it is not. And so we've kind of, you know, we've been debating these terms for a long time. So I think it makes sense to distinguish between moral autonomy on the one hand, in order not to get confused, and operational autonomy on the other hand. I mean, if I'm morally autonomous, and you, if you look at modern philosophers like Kant, Rousseau, or those who followed them, John Rawls, probably if you also look at some of these thinkers in the consequentialist tradition, um, John Stuart Mill, I'm morally autonomous if I act for reasons that kind of I give myself, right? And that's, of course, a very demanding ethical ideal. Um, however, I mean, does Roomba really act for reasons that he gives himself? I mean, I have my doubts about this. So probably, in order to signal this difference, it makes sense to introduce this concept of operational autonomy. And that has nothing to do with the kind of reasons we give ourselves for our actions. That simply means, and that's how it is used in engineering, that a particular machine can carry out tasks independently from an operator. It doesn't need an operator to do it. Roomba can hoover my living room without me being there, right? I just set it to a certain time, I you know, tell him when I want my living room to be hoovered, and it can do that independently of me. And I think that is what we call operational autonomy, but Roomba does not really act for reasons that he gives himself. Um, you could probably further disambiguate uh, this idea of operational autonomy. You could say, for example, that it has a technological capacity uh, condition, and that simply means that the machine can take care of itself, it can carry out the task by itself. But it, had all, but it has also what engineers would call self-direction. Um, and of course, in, in, if a machine is self-directing and is allowed to act within a, a certain domain, that means that I as an operator lift certain restrictions that otherwise would be um, there in order to restrict the machine's actions, right? And th this, this is important because sometimes you have machines which have very, very high levels of technological capacity to be autonomous, but are that are not yet allowed to be fully autonomous. Um, the uh, sentry robot that's used uh, in the demilitarized zone, that might be an example. At the moment, it's actually not making the decision whether to shoot the robot 
rubber gun or machine gun itself. Mm -hmm. If it finds you somewhere in the demilitarized zone and you don't know the password, it will send a signal back to a human operator and the human operator will communicate with you via the robot. So it's not allowed to make a targeting decision by itself at the moment. That targeting decision would be made um, by a human being. But of course it could do that. In theory it could do that. It could make the decision by itself. It's just not allowed to do this at the moment. So it has the technological capacity to carry out all these acts by itself, to make targeting decisions by itself, but the sentry robot presently lacks self-direction. But of course one question is how far do we go? in terms of self-direction. What sort of permissions do we give machines? What kind of restrictions really do we want to live? How far do we want to go? Right. And this is not just science fiction, I should say. I mean, this idea of operational autonomy, I mean, it might sound a bit strange. You know, there are these machines and they're kind of doing stuff by themselves, really. But this is not science fiction. Um, as, we, as we saw earlier, some of these autonomous robotic targeting systems are already being developed. That's the Tenaris aircraft, for example. Tenaris, again, is an unmanned aircraft. It can fly around, it can track radar stations by itself, and it can decide to destroy those radar stations. And of course, as I just said, you have some of these robotic systems that are presently underutilized. Um, so there is some precedent uh, for, there are precedents for this autonomous technology. And of course, the Sentry robot was an example, but you could also probably pick um, non-robotic or computer-based targeting systems like the Israeli Iron Dome. So the Israeli Iron Dome has a radar, uh, very, very crudely put, right? It picks up incoming missiles that are being fired into Israeli territory, and then, you know, it kind of um, computes the, uh, you know, coordinates as to when and where the missile has to be shot down, where it has to be intercepted, and then it will merely issue a recommendation to a human operator, and the human operator will decide whether to shoot down this incoming hostile missile, right? But of course, I mean, in theory, the system could make this decision itself, so it's presently presently underutilized. So it's not science fiction, these machines are there and um, they're currently being developed and of course the, that raises all sorts of ethical issues again. And again, I mean you have, um, you, can, uh, you can ask the same questions that we asked in the context of these remote controlled robotic targeting systems and you could really say, well I mean do these autonomous or operationally autonomous systems really raise any distinctive moral issues that are not found in any other systems? And probably here it's a bit clearer um, than in the case of remote controlled robots. I mean it seems to me that there is a big issue of responsibility or for responsibility. Who in the end is um, responsible for a targeting decision made by the machine. I mean, is it the operator, the programmer, the machine itself. Of course, there's one philosopher um, from Australia, Robert Sparrow, who argues, um, he's, he's got a very complex argument, and I think he blurs the boundaries between moral autonomy and operational autonomy. But essentially, he argues that these machines should not be developed because no one could be held responsible for targeting decisions made. Neither the machine, nor the operator, the commanding officer, nor um, nor the programmer, so they shouldn't be developed at all. That would lead to, an, if they were developed, this would lead to an abdication from responsibility within the armed forces. We don't want that. You can ask a different question, of course. Again, you could ask, you know, are these systems really morally preferable over other systems? And here you get some interesting answers. I mean, so you get, for example, the U.S. roboticist. Uh, Ronald Arkin, and Arkin thinks they're a jolly good idea, and they're absolutely perfect. I mean, they don't go mad. You know, just look, I mean, just look at the history of human warfare. It's been absolutely horrible, you know, Arkin says. I mean, look at all these war crimes people have committed. You know, people going mad, they've seen their comrades getting blown up, you know, they go out and they kill, they kill civilians, they kill non-combatants. So, you know, Robots are not really motivated by fear, they are motivated by algorithms. I mean, if you really want, if you really want to rein in, the destructiveness you know, caused by war, we should leave those sorts of decision, decisions to robots. They are much better at making targeting decisions than we are. So Arkin thinks it's a jolly good idea. There are others who are more critical, of course, and who say, by comparison, I mean, you know, you need to be careful here, Arkin. These machines cannot, un unlike other systems, unlike a human system, for example, that makes targeting decisions, they cannot fulfill certain criteria, for example, the discrimination criteria, necessity criteria, proportionality criteria, in order to assess whether the application of force is really legitimate. So people like Human Rights Watch, they have just written this big uh, report on killer robots, and they are against the idea of these operationally autonomous robots, they are very much against 
Arkin, and they're saying, well, look, compared to other systems, you know, especially human cognitive systems, well, you know, they have some advantages, but really the disadvantages, they are pretty bad, and we don't want these autonomous, operationally autonomous systems to be developed at all. So again, I mean, these are, I think, interesting questions one could ask here. Right, um, so let me just, you know, do the advertisement bit now and just say a little bit about the military enhancement project here um, at Oxford. Right, I mean, at the, um, on the military enhancement project, we're looking at these different robotic targeting systems, both remote-controlled ones and operationally autonomous ones. Uh, we're checking whether these systems comply with law and ethics, and we try to anticipate some of the dilemmas that are arising from the operation of these robotic targeting systems. And I think the ultimate goal of this whole project is that we find ways to enhance targeting decisions. Um, you know, uh, what was the use of introducing these systems? I mean, if there isn't some sort of a benefit associated with it. And since we're talking about these targeting systems, uh, we are specifically um, interested in whether they can be engineered and designed in such a way that targeting decisions actually become better. For example, that they become more uh, precise and so on and so forth. Um, that leads us to make certain design proposals. I mean, the idea is that we make certain design proposals that are hopefully taken up by industry, hopefully taken up by the military, as to how these uh, systems, how targeting decisions can be, um, can be improved. And our design proposal is called e-partnerships. Now, that sounds really quite dodgy. I mean, I've had people who've come up to me and said, Alex, what are you trying to do here? Are you trying to start an online dating agency? <laughs> or, are you trying to, or are you trying to design a combat system? And it's not really such a big difference. I mean, so all is fair in love and war, one wonders. But no, I mean, I'm not interested in setting up a dating agency. I'm interested in uh, well, probably be a lucrative income stream or something. But I am, I'm interested in, 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 in design designing these uh, combat systems. And this is, of course, where my colleague Jack um, has a lot of input. And basically, our idea is, or our argument is that Arkin, uh, with regard to these operational autonomous systems, is really barking up the wrong tree. I mean, that's the wrong way to go. Rather, what we want to do with these e-partnerships is we want to team up human operators with machines and give these machines certain degrees of autonomy. And then, hopefully, utilizing the different perspectives that a human operator can bring to a um, particular situation, that a machine can bring to a particular situa situation, we want to improve targeting decisions. So the idea is not to cut the human out of the loop, as it were, remove the human from the decision-making process, but rather team the human up with a machine and try to get a better decision. Um, as, as a result. And we think that this is ap applicable, of course, to these autonomous systems because, uh, you know, the kind of machine artificial agent team partner could have certain degrees of operational autonomy with regard to certain tasks, but it's also, of course, relevant to these remote control systems. You could say, well, there are some tasks within these systems that probably don't just require an operator sitting there uh, with a joystick making certain decisions. And, you know, that's that. That's where we introduce an element of autonomy into already existing remote control systems. So we think autonomy, operational autonomy, can be a good idea sometimes, but it needs to be used or utilized properly in order to enhance targeting decisions, the alt targeting decisions. And of course, I mean, if we enhance these targeting decisions, if you know, operators have better information, for example, about the kind of targets, if they have a better situation understanding, if the kind of robot probably checks on them, or if, if, if a computer program checks on them, that they are complying and making their targeting decision with international law, with ethical principles from just war theory, we hope that we thereby also enhance a commitment to responsibility. So in this sense, we think that this design of e-partnerships is also always design for um, responsibility. And um, I think that's all I have to say for now. So thank you very much. I won't take up too much of your time. I'll speak for maybe five minutes or, or thereabouts. I'm an international lawyer, Dr. Kande. As Bennett said, I'm the co-director of the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict. And my main area of specialty is, in addition to general international law, the law of armed conflict. And all I really want to do is to ask a very similar question to the question that Alex asked about whether these sorts of systems raise any distinctive legal issues. And I think the dichotomy that Alex drew between these robotic targeting systems that are remote controlled and the robotic targeting systems that are autonomous 
is also critical to answering this question. Do these systems raise any issues that are new um, in, in international law? Now, you will have seen, I'm sure, much of the debate over the last week or so in the media about the US drone program. Um, a white paper was released by the US Department of Justice, the lawyers who were charged with deciding whether or not the president had the authority, the US president had the authority to engage in the program of targeted killing in, in um, Pakistan and in Afghanistan. And one of the things that's interesting when one reads the, the white paper that was issued on, on drones is that the word drones or unmanned aerial vehicles actually does not appear at all. And that's significant because it tells us, or it reinforces the point that Alex made earlier, which is that it's the nature of the activity which was deemed to be significant rather than the means by which the activity was carried out. In other words, what was critical in the discussion was whether or not a program of targeted killings is legally justified rather than the means by which the targeted killings is, is carried out. So if we think about the legal issues that arise in relation to, to targeted killings, one can ask oneself, well, would this be different if it was not carried out using these types of, of systems? Now, the main issue really concerns the characterization of the activity. In other words, the first issue that arises is, is this an activity that is subject to the law of armed conflict, in which case there would be wider permissions for the state to engage in this activity, or is this activity that is not subject to, to the law of armed conflict, in which case we would assume that there are narrower permissions. We'd assume that it's sort of normal uh, human rights law that, that applies. And of course, in the context of what's going on in Afghanistan and, and Pakistan, the reason that this is significant is that, well, it doesn't really look like war. We don't have forces in the field, uh, in particular in, in Pakistan, that are opposing one another. This is the point that Alex was, was making. So it doesn't look like war. And the question is, well, should we regard it as, as something that the law of war applies to? Now, in a sense, the use of the weaponry affects how we think about whether it looks like war or not. But this isn't something that's distinctive to the use of drones or, or autonomous systems, because you could have irregular, in terms of, of the, the, the amount of force that's used, irregular use of, say, fighter jets for, for targeted killings, and we would be in a similar situation. Or, in fact, we could have what is probably the most famous case of targeted killings in Pakistan repeated writ large, which is the killing of Osama bin Laden, which was not done by, by drones, but it raises similar, similar legal issues. And the issue that arises under the law of armed conflict is essentially who is the lawful target and how do we make that determination as to who is the lawful target. And secondly, even when we decide, or if we decide that a target is a lawful target, are the civilian casualties that arise out of the application of force to this target, are they excessive? Right? So decision about who the, who's the lawful target and a decision about whether disproportionate civilian casualties are caused. In relation to remotely controlled uh, weapons, so drones or unmanned aerial vehicles, it doesn't seem to be particularly problematic because the decision is made by a human being. Both decisions, who is a lawful target and whether or not the civilian casualties are disproportionate. And it doesn't seem that that raises any distinctive legal issues, whether or not the human being was in a fighter jet 20,000 feet above the air or whether the person was in Nevada. In fact, some might even argue that if you have a human being who's on the ground, they might be able to see less. They might have less information sometimes to be able to make that determination. Now, what about autonomous weapon systems? In other words, the sorts of systems that Alex was referring to where these decisions are not made by a human being, or potentially anyway would not be made by a human being. So the human being is not selecting the target. And the question that would be raised there 
would be whether or not it is possible to comply with the principle of distinction. So it's a fundamental principle of the law of armed conflict that combatants are legitimate targets, but civilians are not. And the question is, would it be possible to comply with this principle if the decision is not made by, by human, the human being? Now here, I think it's important to draw another <coughs> distinction, the distinction about what type of targets are we talking about? Are we talking about a human target, so targeted killings, or are we talking about an object which is going to be destroyed? So something similar to the Iron Dome system that Alex was referring to, the Israeli defense system that will detect whether there's a missile coming and then will fire, um, I suppose, an anti-missile missile to, to intercept it. Now, if we're talking about a human target, the law of armed conflict <coughs> says that there are two possible bases on which human beings can be legitimate targets. The first basis is that the person is a combatant or is a member of an organized armed group. And there, the person is a target by reason of their status. They're not a target because of what they do. They're a target because of the status and the position that they hold. The second justification for a person being a lawful target is that the person is taking a direct part in hostilities. In other words, the person is a target by reason of what they do. So you have status-based targeting and you have conduct-based targeting. And the question that would arise in relation to these targeting systems is whether or not it would be possible, particularly in relation to, to conduct-based targeting, whether it would be possible for the system, the targeting system, to correctly interpret the situation and to put the person into the right category. And this is an issue that arises particularly in relation to conduct-based targeting because the, um, the, the justification for the person being a target is dependent on what they are doing at that point in time. And the argument that is often made is that human activity is complex. You interpret it on the basis of a range of, of, um, of information and that it's going to be very difficult for a machine to do that. So, for example, I think this is the example that, that Human Rights Watch gives in, in the document that Alex was, was talking about. If you have a mother who is running with her <coughs> children away from somebody who has a gun, and both the family, mother and children, and the gunman are running towards this machine, say the sentry, the sentry robot. In that circumstance, it's possible that what is perceived uh, is a group of people running towards this machine with a weapon. And if you had a human sentry, the person might be able to perceive that, well, the mother is running out of fear, whereas the other person who has the gun is not running out of fear, that they are though they appear to be running together, they're not members of the same group. Essentially, the question is, would it be possible for a machine to make this kind of, of differentiation? With objects, it's perhaps a bit easier. Um, it's perhaps a bit easier because the law relating to the targeting of objects is understandably broader than the law relating to the targeting of, of individuals, in the sense that if you have an object which is, shall I say, dual use. It could be used for military purposes and civilian purposes. The law of armed conflict says that it is a legitimate target, even though it can be used for civilian purposes. But that then takes us to the next question, which I think is perhaps the most difficult question, which is not the question of who or what is a lawful target, but the question of excessive civilian casualties. <laughs> So even when a target is a lawful target, the law of armed conflict says that it should not be the object of an attack if the, shall we say, collateral civilian damage or loss is excessive. Now here, there are at least three things that need to be um, factored into the calculation of whether this principle has been violated, this principle of proportionality. First of all, a judgment has to be made about the value of the military, um, the, the value of the object that is being targeted. 
Secondly, a judgment has to be made or a calculation has to be done about the extent of the civilian casualties that will result from targeting this object. And then thirdly, a calculation has to be done as to the relationship between the value of the military object that you're targeting and the extent of the civilian casualty. So you need to work out somehow whether it is excessive. And what you're trying to achieve is you're trying to see whether or not the extent of the civilian casualties is excessive when compared to the military advantage that one is trying to gain from targeting that, that object. So you need to do at least these three things. Now, I think it's, it's conceivable, probably quite easy to conceive of a machine being able to do the second thing, which is to calculate the extent of the civilian casualties. So I suppose one might say, well, particularly with something like um, the Iron Dome system, which is, you know, it's a fixed system that is assessing whether missiles come in. It probably will have enough information about, or could have in enough information about the amount of debris that will be caused, how widespread it will be, who's living there, that sort of thing. And so that, that might be easy to do. The difficulty comes with the first and the third of these steps. So the first being the value of the military object. And this is something which isn't necessarily um, static, the value of that object. Because what you're trying to work out is the advantage that you're trying to gain by, by destroying it, the military advantage that you're trying to gain. And what's most problematic is actually an assessment of the relationship between the two things. Now, this is something that isn't very clear at all in international law, how one works out what is excessive, even when we know what the value of the military object is, and even when we know what the extent of the civilian casualties are. By what means are we going to determine whether it is excessive or not excessive? This is your classic comparing apples and, and oranges scenario. And it requires some form of, of value judgment. And this is, at least it could be argued, that this is something which will be particularly difficult for a robot to do, to make that assessment. Because we have no, I think the the... the the truth is we have no clear criteria by which to do this. Now, the other difficult point that arises in relation to these autonomous weapon systems, and uh, Alex hinted at it in his presentation, is how we deal with questions of responsibility. Who do we hold responsible when things go, go wrong? Right? So over the last... 20 years or thereabouts, international law has put a lot of emphasis on individual criminal responsibility. So as you know, since the mid-1990s, since the war in the former Yugoslavia and in Rwanda, we've had war crimes tribunals established. We've had ad hoc tribunals for particular conflict situations. We now have the International Criminal Court that has jurisdiction over 120-something countries. And these war crimes tribunals are established to hold individuals to account for violations of the laws of war and for other international crimes. And so the question that arises is, well, if we have these decisions being made by these machines, who do we hold responsible? Is it going to be the designer? If we assume that it's an autonomous system and the dating agency e-partnerships approach isn't adopted or isn't yet adopted and there's no operator alongside? Who do we hold? Is it the commander? So that raises difficult, difficult questions. Now, <coughs> I should say that even though it does raise quest difficult questions, there are ways in which accountability might be established under international law, which one needs to, to think through. So for example, under international criminal law, we have notions of command responsibility. We don't just hold the soldier who has fired the shot responsible for war crimes. Typically, what we do is that we seek to reach higher to find out who is really behind the operation. 
and in, and in particular, these international criminal tribunals are established to hold those who are who bear the greatest responsibility. So typically, they are seeking to hold commanders responsible. The question, of course, arises, how do we establish command responsibility in relation to, to these machines? What standards do we, do we use? So the usual standard in international criminal law for a commander is that either the commander knew or should have known that the crimes were committed or were about to be committed, or alternatively, that the commander knew that the crimes had been committed, but failed to repress them, failed to, to punish them. And the question is whether we can adapt that um, for, for this. The other question, and this is the last thing that I will say that is raised in relation to questions of responsibility and accountability, is that even though international law has devoted a lot of energy over the last 20 years into establishing these international criminal tribunals for individual responsibility, we still have alongside that the notion of state responsibility, at least to the extent that we're talking about a state engaging in armed conflict. The idea that states have these obligations under the law of war and that states ought to be held accountable when things go, things go wrong. But we've not invested a lot of effort into developing mechanisms of accountability for states. We've invested most of our efforts in developing methods of accountability for for individuals. And I suppose the question that's raised is whether, if we go down the route that um, Alex has highlighted, whether we need to think again about state responsibility and state accountability of the state as a whole if we're not able to achieve the individual accountability that we've been pursuing over the last sort of 20 years or thereabouts. So that's it for me, and I hand it back to Ben. All right, uh, thanks both for a uh, really uh, fascinating uh, discussion. And I won't uh, hold you back from asking questions for too long, but I, I do just want to raise uh, one point. So I think that there's a very interesting range of um, ethical uh, questions that are raised if you agree um, that, that using these sorts of technologies doesn't get you off the hook uh, for killing people or, or for destroying things. So you might just think, for example, that using a drone, even a fully autonomous drone, is not really any different from using from launching a, a cruise missile into somebody's uh, country. You know, you still have to build it, you still have to launch it. Maybe there are some complexities about who exactly is most responsible, but it does not it's not diminished responsibility. And if that's the case, then it's sort of a, the the question that always comes up in my mind is, you know, why build them? Right? What what is the en enormous draw uh, to 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 military organisations to build and deploy these things? Right. So I'm just offer one fairly cynical way of answering this question and to see uh, what, what Alex has to say about it. Um, so, so you might think that the reason that, that these drones are attractive to the military is that they take advantage of moral failings uh, both in the soldiers that are involved in flying them or operating them, launching them, uh, and in the kind of broader public. So, you, you know, one, one thing we could think about would be um, you know, people have... A kind of a, a bias, uh, uh, which many moral philosophers think is an irrational bias, uh, in favour of people who are close to them. So to take Peter Singer's famous example, you know, we, we would never uh, allow a child to drown if it was happening right in front of us. Nobody would allow that to happen. But for many of us, it's very easy to allow, uh, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of, of children to die in remote, faraway places. And you might think that this kind of bias, this... this particular moral failing uh, in human beings is being taken advantage of by the drones. So you have a pilot who's in New Mexico, and it's just easier for that pilot to carry out uh, a, the kind of orders that he might object to uh, were he flying a plane or holding a bayonet in Afghanistan. So that, that, that would be one kind of thing. Um, the other bias that you might raise is that people have this kind of uh, nationalistic bias, right? So if you look at uh, a debate in the United States about whether or not to continue the war in Afghanistan or in Iraq, most of it centres around deaths of US troops uh, rather than deaths of civilians. It's almost completely written out of the debate. 
And one of the, the advantages, I suppose, of these drones is that they kind of radically reduce uh, the number of, of deaths. Like, not, not, I mean, if, if you think about the war uh, in Iraq, you know, a lot of, there were a lot of casualties uh, on the British and American side that in the form of uh, accidents, because even getting into one of these planes, it's true that uh, it's not easy for people to shoot back at you if you're in a stealth fighter, but it's pretty easy to die in an accident uh, flying around. And so you do have a certain number of allied deaths, whereas you can guarantee with these drones that nobody on your own side is going to die. And that makes it hard to assail these programs politically, right? So even if you think it's like terribly morally wrong, you're killing all of these civilians, there's not likely to be much political impetus against these things because people are kind of broadly nationalistic about these matters. So you just won't get that kind of uh, snowball uh, of political criticism that would enable a war to, to, to end. So it's no doubt attractive uh, to the generals and to the politicians for this kind of reason as well. And I was just interested in, in what, you, what you would say about, you know, is, is there a, a moral problem uh, with designing the tools of war to take advantage of these sorts of moral shortcomings uh, in the population as a whole? And then we'll open it up to questions. So. If you yeah, want I mean, yeah, I mean, very, very thought-provoking and interesting questions, um, I think. Um, let me probably start off by saying something about this autonomy business, because that's, that's what you first raised. Um, I'm actually not sure um, that the army wants these fully autonomous systems. I mean, the kind of uh, reports that have been uh, produced really by, um, you know, the uh, Department of Defense in the United States seem to indicate that they want, uh, you know, to kind of rein in the extent to which um, these systems may or may not be autonomous. So I'm partly wondering what the critics of these systems like Human Rights Watch are up to when they're saying, no, 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 we don't want these killer robots. And the major says, well, we don't want them either. Well, it seems to be a very strange, strange situation where Human Rights Watch and um, the military kind of are in agreement um, on an issue. Um, on the Peter Singer uh, bit and on the kind of of distance that's being introduced and how distance becomes more relevant. Yes, I mean, I, I think this is a very interesting point, actually. Um, I, I think there are a number of issues there. I mean, let, let me answer this with a historical example. Um, a couple of months back, uh, a, a group of German academics um, um, released a book called Soldaten on uh, killing, on dying, and on war, something like that. It's recently come out in the UK as well. I didn't include it, uh, transcripts uh, from German prisoners of war in Great Britain, especially, you know, these soldiers kind of telling quite candidly what they've been up to. And there is this uh, one interview with um, a Luftwaffe pilot, and uh, he says, well, you know, I kind of was flying towards this factory in order to bomb it, and I was just looking out my cockpit window, and I saw all these people running away from it, and I just dropped my bomb, and I looked again, they were all lying down. Right? And he was talking about this kind of matter of factly, as if nothing would happen. It, it looked like kind of a toy city in a way that he bombed. You know, these like, little dots were running around there. And then, uh, you know, they were all lying down. They had all died. But he didn't seem to really understand or appreciate the kind of gravity or moral gravity of the situation. It really kind of seemed like a toy town that he bombarded. And, of course, I mean, in this kind, in, in this case, you already have a certain moral desensitization that's being introduced by the airplane. And that's something I think that we find very common in war. I mean, we try to put this distance between us and the enemy just because it makes it probably easier to overcome certain um, internal obstacles against killing. But I'm unsure whether this is really something new that's just new with these particular drones. I mean, I think this kind of Luftwaffe example just showed that it's always been around. It probably has been around, um, you know, also with the introduction of artillery. You said, oh, those bastards <laughs> over there. I don't really care. I just press it. Different situation from, a, you know, from a situation where you're lying in a trench and the other guy is 10 meters away, right? And you have to kill that person. Um, of course, I mean, there is, there is, I think there is an interesting issue here. I mean, you could, of course, always ask, you know, what kind of attitudes do these people take up to their potential targets? I mean, they're sitting there and they're saying, well, you know, I just press the button, I don't care. Or there is this kind of moral desensitization going on. You know, this is, these are just sort of these little people, some, uh, like I'm looking outside my cockpit window, ha ha, now they're all lying down. Um, this is, of course, sort of one, one question. And the, the question here is, um, does this really translate, this moral desensitization, into non-compliance with 
the laws of war and with principles from just war theory. Of course, I mean, people and soldiers in war might have all sorts of terrible attitudes towards the enemy. I mean, they may not consider them fully human or they may simply not care or they would simply kind of, um, you know, perceive them as some blip somewhere on a radar screen. Um, but does this automatically translate into non-compliance? And, you know, this is one of the uh, critiques that's sometimes leveled against these remote control systems, that they make the people who operate them trigger happy. They're kind of removed from the horrors of war. And just as this kind of German pilot um, earlier during World War II, I mean, just looks out his cockpit window and she doesn't seem to perceive the gravity of the situation, those new combatants who are now sitting somewhere in Nevada or New Mexico, for them it's just a video game. Is this really morally problematic? One wonders. Or is this in itself morally problematic that they're adopting this attitude? Or is this only morally problematic if it um, kind of is transformed into certain behavior, into non-compliance? And of course, I mean, if it does lead to more non-compliance with the laws of war, I think then we have to rethink um, these kinds of technologies, and I think quite considerably. On the nationalistic bias, yeah, I think that's an interesting argument. And there is the bigger question of political control, and uh, especially also democratic control, and how we view war and how we view the wars of the future, how engaged we are as citizens with what politicians ultimately do in our name. And indeed, I mean, there is this argument that it might probably become easier to conduct military operations because um, you don't really have to you know, face the threat of um, friendly casualties, of very high casualties amongst your own troops. I mean, I think, I think time will tell, I mean, whether there is going to be this broader public desensitization about armed conflict because of these technologies, well, there isn't. Um, I think the jury is still out there. I think we'll see. On the other hand, I mean, one, you know, it has to say that this drone warfare is attracting attention at the moment. It is attracting attention in the U.S. and also beyond the U.S. And, of course, a lot of people have shown up today. So it seems to me that citizens are aware, you know, of these problems and are kind of trying to think about the attitude they should adopt towards Towards that. I mean, interesting, just, just very briefly on this, on this drone warfare. I mean, one reason why it's so secret is because the um, CIA mostly carries out these targeted killings. So we have the James Bond scenario again. Um, here you have sort of the Secret Service being active rather than the army. And of course, the, it again raises this question about war, who participates in war, who fights war. And that will, of course, also decide on the kind of democratic accountability and of the public perception of armed, armed conflict.